Chronicle of the Times In the Dark by Edith Nesbitt Edith Nesbitt was born in 1858. Her father died when she was only three, and her impoverished family moved continually all over England. As a young married woman with small children, she sold stories and poems to supplement the family income. Her first children's book, The Treasure Seekers, was published in 1899. She also wrote Five Children and It, but her most famous story, The Railway Children, was first published in 1905 and has never been out of print. Edith Nesbitt died in 1924. It may have been a form of madness, or it may be that he really was what is called haunted, or it may, although I don't pretend to understand how, have been the development through intense suffering of a sixth sense in a very nervous, highly strung nature. Something certainly led him where they were, and to him they were all one. He told me the first part of the story, and the last part of it I saw with my very own eyes. Haldane and I were friends, even in our school days. What first brought us together was our common hatred of Visager, who came from our part of the country. His people knew our people at home, so he was put on to us when he came. He was the most intolerable person, boy and man, that I've ever known. He would not tell a lie, and that was all right, but he didn't stop at that. If he were asked whether any other chap had done anything, been out of bounds, or been up to any sort of lark, he would always say, I don't know, sir, but I believe so. He never did know. We took care of that, but what he believed was always right, I remember. Haldane twisting his arm to say how he knew about that cherry tree business, and he only said, I don't know, I just feel sure, and I was right, you see. What can you do with a boy like that? We grew up to be men, at least Haldane and I did. Visager grew up to be a prig. He was a vegetarian and a teetotaler, and an all wooler and Christian scientist, and all the things that prigs are, but he wasn't a common prig. He knew all sorts of things that he oughtn't to have known, that he couldn't have known in any ordinary, decent way. It wasn't that he found things out, he just knew them. Once when I was very unhappy, he came into my rooms, we were all in our last year at Oxford, and he talked about things I hardly knew myself. That was really why I went to India that winter. It was bad enough to be unhappy without having the beast knowing all about it. I was away over a year. Coming back, I thought a lot about how jolly it would be to see Haldane again. If I thought about it, Visager at all, I wished he was dead, but I didn't think about him much. I did see Haldane. He was always such a jolly chap, gay and kindly and simple, honourable, upright, and full of practical sympathies. I longed to see him, to see the smile in his jolly blue eyes, looking out from the net of wrinkles that laughing had made round them, to hear his jolly laugh and to feel the good grip of his big hand. I went straight from the docks to his chambers in Grey's Inn, and I found him cold, pale, and anemic, with dull eyes and a limp hand, and pale lips that smiled without mirth, and uttered a welcome without gladness. He was surrounded by a litter of disordered furniture and personal effects half-packed. Some big boxes stood corded, and there were cases of books filled and waiting for the enclosing boards to be nailed on. Yes, I'm moving, he said. Can't stand these rooms. 
there's something rum about them. Something devilish rum. I clear out tomorrow. The autumn dusk was filling the corners with shadow. You've got the furs, I said, just something to say, for I saw the big case that held them lying corded among the others. Furs? He said, uh, oh yes, thanks awfully, yes. I forgot about the furs. He laughed out of politeness, I suppose, for there was no joke about the furs. There were many and fine, the best I could get for the money, and I had seen them packed and sent off when my heart was very sore. He stood looking at me, saying nothing. Come out and have a bit of dinner, I said as cheerfully as I could. Too busy, he answered, after the slightest possible pause and a glance around the room. Look here, I I'm awfully glad to see you. If you just slip over and order in dinner, I'll go myself, only, well, you see how it is. I went, and when I came back, he had cleared a space near the fire and moved his big gate table into it. We dined there by candlelight. I tried to be amusing. He, I am sure, tried to be amusing, but we did not succeed, either of us, and his haggard eyes watched me all the time, save in those fleeting moments when, without turning his head, he glanced back over his shoulder into the shadows that crowded around the little lighted place where we sat. When we had dined and the man had come and taken away the dishes, I looked at Haldane very steadily, so that he stopped in a pointless anecdote and looked interrogation at me. Well, I said, you're not listening, he said petulantly. What's the matter? That's what you better tell me, I said. He was silent, gave one of those furtive glances at the shadow and stooped to stir the fire. I knew it, a blaze that must light every corner of the room. You're all to pieces, I said cheerfully. What have you been up to? Wine, cards, speculation, a woman. If you won't tell me, you'll have to tell your doctor. Why, my dear chap, you're a wreck. You're a comfortable friend to have about the place, he said and smiled a mechanical smile, not at all pleasant to see. I'm the friend you want, I think, said I. Do you suppose I'm blind? Something's gone wrong, and you've taken to something. Morphia, perhaps? And you've brooded over the thing till you've lost all sense of proportion. Out with it, old chap. I bet you a dollar it's not so bad as you think it is. If I could tell you, or... Tell anyone, he said slowly, it wouldn't be so bad as it is. If I could tell anyone, I'd tell you. And even as it is, I've told you more than I've told anyone else. I could get nothing more out of him. But he pressed me to stay, would have given me his bed and made himself a shakedown, he said, but I had engaged my room at the Victoria, and I was expecting letters, so I left him quite late, and he stood on the stairs holding a candle over the banisters to light me down. When I came back next morning, he was gone. Men were moving his furniture into a big van with somebody's pantechnicon painted on it in big letters. He had left no address with the porter, and had driven off in a hansom with two portmanteaus to Waterloo, the porter thought. Well, a man has a right to the monopoly of his own troubles if he chooses to have it, and I had troubles of my own that kept me busy. It was more than a year later that I saw Haldine again. I had got rooms in the Albany by this time, and he turned up there one morning very early indeed, before breakfast, in fact, and if he looked ghastly before, he now looked ghostly. His face looked as though it had worn thin, like an oyster shell that has for years been cast up twice a day by the sea on a shore all pebbly. His hands were thin as birds' claws, 
and they trembled like caught butterflies. I welcomed him in with enthusiastic cordiality and pressed breakfast on him. This time I decided I would ask no questions, for I saw that none were needed. He would tell me, he intended to tell me, he had come here to tell me, and for nothing else. I lit the spirit lamp, I made coffee and small talk for him, and I ate and drank, and waited for him to begin. And it was like this that he began. I am going, he said, to kill myself. Oh, don't be alarmed. I suppose I had said or looked something. I shan't do it here or now. I shall do it when I have to, when I can't bear it any longer, and I want someone to know why. I don't want to feel that I'm the only living creature who does know, and I can trust you, can't I? I murmured something reassuring. I should like you, if you don't mind, to give me your word that you won't tell a soul what I'm going to tell you as long as I'm alive. Afterwards, you can tell whom you please. I gave him my word. He sat silent, looking at the fire. Then he shrugged his shoulders. It's extraordinary how difficult it is to say it, he said, and smiled. The fact is, you know that beast, George Visiger. Yes, I said, I haven't seen him since I came back. Someone told me he'd gone to some island or some other to preach vegetarianism to cannibals. Anyhow, he's out of the way. Bad luck to him. Yes, said Haldine, he's out of the way, but he's not preaching anything in point of fact he's dead dead was all i could think of to say yes he said it's not generally known but he is what did he die of i asked not that i cared the bare fact was good enough for me you know what an interfering chap he always was always knew everything heart to heart talks and have everything open and above board. Well, he interfered between me and someone else, and told her a pack of lies. Lies? Well, the things were true, but he made lies of them the way he told them. You know I did. I nodded, and she threw me over, and she died. And we weren't even friends. And I couldn't see her before. I couldn't even, oh my God. But I went to the funeral. He was there. They asked him. And then I came back to my rooms. And I was sitting there thinking. And he came up. He would do. It's just what he would do. The beast. I hope you kicked him out. No, I didn't. I listened to what he'd got to say. He came to say... No doubt it was all for the best, and he hadn't known the things he told her. He'd only guessed. He'd guessed right, damn him. What right had he to guess right? And he said it was all for the best, because he, besides that, there was madness in my family. He'd found that out, too. And is there? If there is, I didn't know it. And that was why it was all for the best. So then I said, there wasn't any madness in my family before, but there is now. And I got hold of his throat. I'm not sure whether I meant to kill him. I ought to have meant to kill him. Anyhow, I did kill him. What do you say? I said nothing. It is not easy to think at once of the tactful and suitable thing to say when your oldest friend tells you he is a murderer. When I could get my hands out of his throat, it was as difficult as this to drop the handles of a galvic battery. He fell in a lump on the hearthrug, and I saw what I'd done. How is it that murderers ever get found out? They're, they're careless, I suppose, I find myself saying. They lose their nerve. I didn't, he said. I never was calmer. I sat down in the big chair and looked at him and thought it all out. 
He was just off to that island. I knew that. He'd said goodbye to everyone. He'd told me that. There was no blood to get rid of, or only a touch at the corner of his slack mouth. He wasn't going to travel in his own name because of interviewers. Mr. Somebody Something's luggage would be undeclaimed and his cabin empty. No one would guess that Mr. Somebody Something was Sir George Visager, F.R.S. It was all as plain as plain. There was nothing to get rid of but the man. No weapons, no blood, and I got rid of him all right. How? He smiled, cunningly. No, no, he said, that's where I draw the line. It's not that I doubt your word if you've talked in your sleep or had a fever or anything. No, no, as long as you don't know where the body is, don't you see, I'm all right. Even if you could prove that I've said all of this, which you can't, it's only the wanderings of my poor, unhinged brain. See, I saw, and I was sorry for him. I did not believe that he had killed Visager. He was not that sort of man who kills people. So I said, yes, old chap, I see. Now look here, let's go away together, you and I. Travel a bit and see the world and forget all about that beastly chap. His eyes lighted up at that. Why, he said, you understand you don't hate me and shrink from me. I wish I'd told you before. You know, when you came and I was panicking and packing all of my sticks. It's too late now. Too late? Not a bit of it, I said. Come, we'll pack your traps and be out and off tonight, out into the unknown, don't you know? That's where I'm going, he said. You wait. When you've heard what's been happening to me, you won't be so keen to go travelling about with me. But you've told me what's been happening to you, I said. And the more I thought about what he had told me, the less I believed him. No, he said slowly, no, I've told you what happened to him. What happened to me is quite different. Did I tell you what his last words were? Just when I was coming at him, before I'd got his throat, you know, he said, he said, look out. You'll never be able to get rid of the body. Besides, anger is sinful. You know, that way he had, like a track on its hind legs. So afterward, I got thinking, of, but I didn't think of it for a year, because I did get rid of his body. And then I was sitting in that comfortable chair, and I thought, hmm, hello, it must be about a year now since that, and I pulled out my pocket book and went to the window to look at a little almanac I carry about. It was getting dusk, and sure enough, it was a year to the day, and then I remembered what he said, and I said to myself, not much trouble about getting rid of your body, you brute, and then I looked at the hearth rug, and ah! He screamed suddenly and very loud. I can't tell you. No, I can't. My man opened the door. He wore a smooth face over his wriggling curiosity. Uh, did you call, sir? Yes, I lied. I want you to take a note to the bank and wait for an answer. And he said, where was I? You were just telling me what happened after you looked at the almanac. What was it? Uh, nothing much, he said, laughing and softly. Oh, uh, nothing much, only that I glanced at the hearth rug, and there he was. The man I'd killed a year before. Don't try to explain, or I shall lose my temper. The door was shut. The windows were shut. He hadn't been there a minute before, but he was there then. That's all. Hallucination was one of the words I stumbled. Among exactly what I thought, he said triumphantly, but I touched it. It was quite real, heavy, you know, and harder than live people are. 
somehow to the touch. More like a stone thing covered with kid, the hands were, and the arms, like a marble statue in a blue serge suit. Don't you hate men who wear blue serge suits? There are hallucinations of touch, too, I found myself saying. Exactly what I thought said Haldane, more triumphant than ever. But there are limits, you know, limits. So then I thought someone had got him out, the real him, and stuck him there to frighten me, while my back was turned, and I went to the place where I'd hidden him, and he was there, ah, just as I'd left him, only it was a year ago, and there are two of him there now. My dear chap, I said, this is simply comic. Yes, he said, it is amusing. I find it so myself, especially in the night when I wake up and think of it. I hope I shan't die in the dark, Winston. That's one of the reasons why I think I shall have to kill myself. I could be sure then of not dying in the dark. Is that all, I asked, feeling sure that it must be? No, said Haladine at once. That's not all. He's coming back to me again. In a railway carriage it was. I'd been asleep. When I woke up, there he was, lying on the seat opposite me, looking just the same, and I pitched him out onto the line in Red Hill Tunnel. And if I see him again... I'm going out myself. I can't stand it. It's too much. I'd sooner go. Whatever the next world's like, there aren't things in it like that. We leave them here in graves and boxes, and you think I'm mad, but I'm not. You can't help me. No one can help me. He knew, you see. He said I shouldn't be able to get rid of the body. And I, I can't get rid of it. I can't. I can't. He knew. He always did know the things that he couldn't know. But I'll cut his game short. After all, I've got the ace of trumps, and I play it on his next trick. I give you my word of honour, Winston, that I'm not mad. My dear old man, I said, I don't think you're mad. But I do think your nerves are very much upset. Mine are a bit too. Do you know why I went to India? It was because of you and her. I couldn't stay and see it through, although I wished for your happiness and all of that. You know I did. And when I came back, she and you, let's see it out together. I said, you won't keep fancying things if you've got me to talk to, and I always said you weren't half a bad old duffer. She liked you, he said. Oh, yes, I said. She liked me. That was how we came to go abroad together. I was full of hope for him. He'd always been such a splendid chap, so sane and strong. I couldn't believe that he was gone mad, gone forever, I mean, so that he'd never come right again. Perhaps my own trouble made it easy for me to see things not quite straight. Anyhow, I took him away to recover his mind's health, exactly as I should have taken him away to get strong after a fever, and the madness seemed to pass away, and in a month or two we were perfectly jolly, and I thought I had cured him, and I was very glad because of that old friendship of ours, and because she loved him and liked me. We, we never spoke of Visager. I thought he had forgotten all about him. I thought I understood how his mind, overstrained by sorrow and anger, had fixed on the man he hated, and woven a nightmare web of horror round that detestable personality. And I had got the whip a hand of my trouble, and we were as jolly as sandboys together all those months. And we came to Bruges at last in our travels, and Bruges was very full. 
because of the exhibition. We could only get one room and one bed, so we tossed for the bed, and the one who lost the toss was to make the best of the night in the armchair, and the bedclothes we were to share equitably. We spent the evening at a café chantant, and finished at a beer hall, and it was late and sleepy when we got back to Grand Vigne. I took our key from its nail in the concierge's room, and we went up. We talked a while, I remember, of the town and the belfry, and the Venetian aspect of the canals by moonlight, and then Haldane got into bed, and I made a chrysalis of myself with my share of the blankets, and fitted the tight roll into the armchair. I was not at all comfortable, but I was compensatingly tired, and I was nearly asleep when Haldane roused up to tell me about his will. I've uh, left you everything to you, old man, he said. I know I can trust you to see to everything. Quite so, said I, and if you don't mind, we'll talk about it in the morning. He tried to go on about it and about what a friend I'd been and all that, but I shut him up and told him to go to sleep. But no, he wasn't comfortable, he said, and he got a thirst like a lime kiln, and he'd noticed that there was no water bottle in the room, and the water in the jug was like a pale soup, he said. Oh, all right, said I, light your candle and go out and get some water. Then, in heaven's name, let me go to sleep. But he said, no, you light it. I don't want to get out of bed in the dark. I might, I might step on something, mightn't I, or walk into something that wasn't there when I got into bed. Rot, I said, walk into your grandmother. But I lit the candle all the same. He sat up in bed and looked at me, very pale, with his hair all tumbled from the pillow and his eyes blinking and shining. That's better, he said, and then I say, look here, yes, I see, it's all right, queer how they mark the sheets here, blessed if I didn't think it was blood just for the minute. The sheet was marked, not at the corner as sheets are marked at home, but right in the middle where it turns down with a big red cross stitching. Yes, I see, I said. It is a queer place to mark it. It's queer letters to have on it, he said. G. V. Grand Vigne, I said. What letters do you expect them to mark things with? Hurry up. You come too, he said. Yes, it does stand for Grand Vigne, of course. I wish you'd come down too, Winston. I'll go down, I said, and turned with the candle in my hand. He was out of bed and close to me in a flash. No, said he, I don't want to stay alone in the dark. He said it, just as a frightened child might have done. All right, then, come along, I said, and we went. I tried to make some joke. I remember about the length of his hair and the cut of his pyjamas, but I was sick with disappointment, for it was almost quite plain to me, even then, that all my time and trouble had been thrown away, and that he wasn't cured at all. We went down as quietly as we could and got a carafe of water from the long bare dining table in the salle à manger. He got hold of my arm at first, and then he got the candle away from me and went very slowly, shadowing the light with his hand and looking very carefully all about as though he expected to see something that he wanted very desperately not to see. And, of course, I knew what that something was. I didn't like the way he was going on. I can't at all express how deeply I didn't like it. And he looked over his shoulder every now and then, just as he did that first evening after I came back from India. The thing got on my nerves so I could hardly find the way back to our room and when we got there, I give you my word, I more than half expected to see what he had expected to see, that or something like that, on the hearthrug, but of course there was nothing. 
I blew out the light and tightened my blankets round me. I'd been trailing them after me in our expedition, and I was settled in my chair when Haldane spoke. You've got all the blankets, he said. No, I haven't, said I, only what I always had. I can't find mine, then, he said, and I could hear his teeth chattering, and I'm cold. I'm, for God's sake, like the candle, light it, light it, something horrible, and I couldn't find the matches. Light the candle, light the candle, he said, and his voice broke, as a boy's does, sometimes in chapel. If you don't, he'll come to me. It is so easy to come at anyone in the dark. Oh, Winston, light the candle. For the love of God, I can't die in the dark. I am lighting it, I said savagely, and I was feeling for the matches on the marble-topped chest of drawers, on the mantelpiece, everywhere, but on the round centre table where I'd put them. You're not going to die. Don't be a fool, I said. It's all right. I'll get a light in a second. He said, it's, it's cold. It's cold. It's cold. Like that three times. And then he screamed aloud, like a woman, like a child, like a hare, when the dogs have got it. I had heard him scream like that once before. What is it? I cried, hardly less loud. For God's sake, hold your noise. What is it? There was an empty silence. Then, very slowly, it's visager, he said, and he spoke thickly as though some stifling veil. Nonsense. Where? I asked, and my hand closed on the matches as he spoke. Here, he screamed sharply, as though he had torn the veil away. Here, beside me, in the bed. I got the candle alight, and I got across to him. He was crushed in a heap at the edge of the bed. Stretched on the bed beyond him was a dead man, white and very cold. Haldane had died in the dark. It was all so simple. We had come to the wrong room. The man the room belonged to was there on the bed. He had engaged and paid for before he died of heart disease earlier in that day. A French commis voyageur representing soap and perfumery, his name was Félix Leblanc. Later in England, I made cautious inquiries. The body of a man had been found in the Red Hill Tunnel, a haberdasher man named Simmons, who'd had drunk spirits of salts owing to the depression of trade. The bottle was clutched in his dead hand. For reasons that I had, I took care to have a police inspector with me when I opened the boxes that came to me by Haldane's will. One of them was the big box, metal lined, in which I had sent him the skins from India. God help us all. It was closely soldered. Insides were the skins of beasts? No. The bodies of two men. One was identified, after some trouble, as that of a hawker of pens in city offices, subject to fits. He had died in one, it seemed, and the other body was visagers, right enough. Explain it as you like. I offered you, if you remember, a choice of explanations before I began the story. I have not yet found the explanation that can satisfy me.